Hello, everyone, and welcome to this final talk of the day uh, called Vaporware. So I was just thinking, what if you all showed up here and there was nothing? Uh, because that's really what Vaporware is about, nothing uh, really happening. And uh, sometimes we in the IT industry use the word slideware for those kinds of things that never come into existence. And if there's one thing we've got, it's slides. <laughs> Yes, Emma. Welcome to the final session of the day. I'm Anders Norris, and I'm going to tell you a few stories. And we start off in the mountains of British Columbia in Canada. These two mountains are known as Whistler Mountain and Blackcomb Mountain. And for those of you familiar with Windows code names, you might know that Windows Whistler was the code name for Windows XP. Windows Blackcom was the code name for Windows 7. But this is not the story of either of those versions of Windows. This is the long lost story about Windows Longhorn. And in between these two mountains, there is an Afro ski place where the XX on the Windows team at Microsoft used to go for their strategy sessions. And down there you will find the Longhorn Saloon and Grill, which is where they took the name for Windows Longhorn from. And even before Microsoft released Windows XP, they started the hype machine and hyping up about the world about this next great big version of Windows that was going to be re released, known as Windows Longhorn. This is Windows Longhorn. Or at least this is the internal Microsoft concept video of Windows Longhorn that they were intending to make. In fact, this is not built with any Microsoft technologies at all. This is built with something called Macromedia Flash. And I must say, the people in the UX design department at Microsoft are true wizards of Macromedia Flash. Because of those of you who remember when websites were built in Flash, you probably never have seen anything that looked as good or as advanced as this built with that. But they had great visions for what this Windows Longhorn product was to be. And uh, the first leak that came out from Microsoft was in October 2002 it looked a whole lot like Windows XP. The only curious thing was that it wasn't built on Windows XP, it was built on Windows Server, because they had such grand visions for the, this thing that they needed the computing power of a server, not a regular desktop OS, to make this come into being. And then sort of time passed and new leaks came out. The hype machine was running strong uh, on the Windows Developers Conference. They released something with the Plex UI, which resembles this thing in, um, in the prototype. And they kept on going. But this was built on a few pillars that were to be the next version of Windows. One of them is the Plex UI, as we can see it, with see-through windows used and loads of bells and whistles and utilizing the hardware acceleration in graphics chips that were just coming on, on the market. The other thing was the sidebar on the right side we see here. For that, they were building a new integration package that would integrate WS Star web services straight into your Windows desktop environment. And this was part of one of Bill Gates' big wishes, something called Microsoft Hailstorm, where he foresaw that people would be creating web services to supply information to home computers. And of course, you need the WS Star stack with proper security and everything to get a weather forecast on the desktop. The last thing they had was the WinFS file system to build this thing on top. And for that, they 
started building a fi file system built on top of Microsoft SQL Server. So a relational database to store all of your files so that you could have tags and things like that. And you could do queries towards who um, that I follow on Twitter is in the room at DevOps UK now. Zero rows return, probably. So, but they, this just kept on going, and uh, time went by, but nothing was ever released. And that's the thing that happens when you start building something uh, and you name your project from an upper ski place. Things tend to slide. And I have a video from that upper ski place of the product team. Woo! Oh, and I say, this can make a grown man cry. And Bill Gates has been known to say that the choice of code name Windows Longhorn was a bit random. <laughs> probably wasn't. But I think that probably quite a few of you in here build business software for a living. Am I right? Yeah? Uh, if not, I'm curious what you're doing. And this was, this was a big part of what the, the Windows Longhorn Vision was about. It was about the next generation oops, of productivity software. And this is the promotional video from the Microsoft Apps team. And their outlook on the state of development was a bit gloom. Uh, there are like loads of quotes. Uh, idle employees going for coffee. So, but again, this was the Avalon UI. It was the Indigo messaging system, and it was the WinFS thing that they were building this on. And all of those things were Microsoft.NET technologies. And the Microsoft.NET platform had just been released prior to this. So, they were building all of this on Microsoft.net until something within, which is known within Microsoft as the big reset happened. After six years in development, they just rolled back to the initial branch and started all over again and started building what was eventually to be known as Windows Vista. But they introduced one rule for this. And that was that no Microsoft.NET technology was to be used for development of Windows whatsoever. Because Microsoft.NET at that time was just not mature enough to build Windows. So, business and software. Just in case anyone is thinking that maybe this is some kind of uh, prototype or something, let's uh, run a, a classic application. Uh, anyone remember VisiCalc? Ladies and gentlemen, VisiCalc. And this was from the Microsoft PDC conference in 2003, where the Windows team were demoing Windows Longhorn. And the one application they ran to show that this could run proper software was WYSIWYG. And that brings us to our next story. There have been two real explosions that have propelled the industry forward. The first one uh, really happened in 1977, and it was the spreadsheet. I remember when uh, Dan Feilstra, who ran the company that marketed the first spreadsheet, walked into my office at Apple one day and pulled out this disk from his uh, vest pocket and said, I, I have this incredible new program. I call it a visual calculator, and it became VisiCalc. And that's what really drove, propelled the Apple II to, to the success it, it achieved. So back at the beginning of the 1980s, productivity software was all the rage. That was what everything was about. And as we just heard, WYSIWYG was one of the big ones. But one thing at that time was that there were individual products for different things. So WYSIWYG was a spreadsheet. And there were other spreadsheets around as well. Lotus 1, 2, 3 was one of the best known at the time. And then you had things like Word, Star for Word Processing, and um, other productivity tools. There were no productivity suites as we have with Microsoft Office 365 these days. They were all individual tools. And uh, Ovation Software set out to change that. 
And uh, they announced in 1983 their product, which was an integrated suite of productivity tools. So you wouldn't just have a spreadsheet or a word processor. You would actually have a spreadsheet, a word processor, a contact management tool, a productivity uh, database, a communication package, and everything rolled into one. And that was, uh, was this product they had. It got vast amounts of press coverage. This is just one example uh, where uh, the industry really covers this thing, writes page up and page down about this amazing product that will soon be released to the world. And this is the actual UI. And this was actually quite revolutionary at the time. No one had ever done things like this. Put a pie chart in with the text. So, um, so not strange that this gets a lot of attention. And uh, there was just one thing uh, that the, the industry press who were writing about this maybe should have asked critical questions about. Because when Ovation Technologies were demoing their product at different industry conferences, they never showed this on an actual computer. What they did was they, sh they ran a demo of a VHS videotape. And that was the thing. There, there was no product at all. They had created the, this, this thing, uh, burnt through millions of dollars of uh, VC money, and then in 1984, after just one year, they went bankrupt. And that was something that accumulated in a really interesting story building up in, uh, in the press. Because someone were calling them out uh, on this. And then Robert Kutnick, who was the CTO of the company, got into this really fierce shitstorm with the CEO of the company um, publicly in interviews um, where he started talking about the requirements that they had for developing this product. And they had requirements like this product needs to have uh, 7 million cells in their spreadsheet. 7 million is quite an arbitrary number. Uh, Lotus 1 to 3, which was the market leader at the time, had the capacity of 2 million. So 7 million is at least six times as good. Uh, but that introduced loads of interesting computer science uh, problems, like you had to manage virtual memory. So the, the tech department were not really building the product. They were solving entirely different uh, challenges. And finally, uh, the word vaporware appears on print in the industry press. And the Ovation Technology Project was what was written about when this happened. And this was part of a trend that we were seeing in the IT industry in the early 80s, that loads of products were announced and they were never re released. So the word vaporware, we have these two to thank for that. This is uh, Anne Winbold on us. I was not supposed to advance that, sorry about that. Um, Anne Winbold uh, on the left-hand side, um, and Esther Dyson on the right-hand side here. Uh, Anne Winbold met Esther Dyson at a tech conference that Esther Dyson hosted in 1983. At this conference, she also met the person who is, she is most known for being married to, or being an ex-girlfriend of, who was Bill Gates. So Anne Winbold, best known for being Bill Gates' ex-girlfriend, uh, but she is the one who coined the term vaporware. And she told Esther about this. And uh, Esther wrote an article in her newsletter, the Rosen Electronic Letter, or Release for short. This is the November 1983 issue of that newsletter, where she writes about the phenomenon of software that never comes to be. And she calls out quite a few here. Uh, these are some of them. Um, she might have been a bit early on some of these. Uh, Fox Space would later become Fox Pro, which for a long time was one of Microsoft's development tools. Uh, so once in a while, it might actually be worth the wait to wait for software. 
and someone who waited for quite some time were gamers. This is a classic game. This is the first Duke Nukem game from 1991, released by Apogee Software. Um, it was quite innovative. Uh, it might not look like that today, but it had a scrolling mechanism that uh, John Carmack, who later went on to become a legend, uh, creating Doom and other games, helped out with creating. And they released a similar one called Duke Nukem 2 in 1993. But it was when Duke Nukem 3D was released in 1996. Things really started to happen. So this rocked the PC gaming market. Uh, it was a 3D first-person shooter, uh, first of its kind, with a, a plot where you were playing this typical 90s action hero, uh, saving the world, saving strippers or, sorry, exotic dancers in uh, Los Angeles from an alien invasion. That was a concept that went home with many teenage boys who played this in their bedrooms. And uh, as, as every have, when you have a great success, you're expected to follow that up. So the year after, 3D Realms announced the follow-up. I was born to rock the world. Because this is, of course, the story of Duke Nukem Forever. The most famous vaporware there ever was. So, at the time they were building this, um, 3D Realms was also working on another uh, first-person shooter called Prey, and they were building their own gaming engine for that, called the Prey Engine. But for Duke Nukem Forever, they wanted nothing but the best. They strive for perfection. So uh, they announced that they will use not their own Prey engine, but they will use the Quake engine instead. The reason for this is that uh, a few months prior, uh, another game called Quake had been released, and that was then the gold standard for first-person shooter games at the, on the PC platform. So, we strive for nothing but perfection, so we're going to use the Quake engine. A year passes. A game known as Unreal is released. We strive for nothing but perfection, so we are changing the gaming engine to use the Unreal engine instead. So, they announced this, and it just keeps on going. Um, come the year 2000, uh, nothing is released. Um, but they are, they are strapped with cash, so they can keep on developing this. And um, their publishing company grows a bit um, tired with this, so uh, they get into an argument about this. Um, unfortunately, the publishing company buys another success game from 3D Realm, so they have even more money to just keep on building this thing, and they, they just keep on going. Now, the word of advice here, uh, anyone working with front-end development, it might not be wise to change your uh, JavaScript framework whenever something new is released. Take, uh, just take away from this. But we come to 2001, and it's the 10-year anniversary for Duke Nukem. In a new trailer. And we are already starting to get no nostalgic about the original game from 1991. And they are sort of building the myth about how good this game is going to be. And this looks fairly impressive, 2001, this. Uh, so they keep on. Um, this is uh, Windows Long Arm, by the way. Um, the press catches up on uh, this because nothing happens. Even CNN writes a story on the, the ongoing battle between the developers of Duke Nukem Forever and their publisher. And uh, finally, they actually run out of money. But then something interesting happens. 2010, so nine years later, at the Penny Arcade Expo, it is announced that anyone 17 years or older can come to the Take-Two Interactive booth and play a preview version of Duke Nukem Forever. And this is the actual line. 
it goes on forever and ever all around the expo area. So if anyone has a booth downstairs, if you had a line like this, you're in for a hefty bonus, I think. So uh, this was it. Come May 24th, 2011, and Duke Nukem Forever is released. Finally. This is how the game starts. This is taking yeah, forever. Um, Time to start the reviews were less than stellar, I can tell you. Uh, so... One of the magazines who reviewed this used for the first time ever the minus thousand score for this. Another one writes that the only good thing about this game was that it finally was released. And, uh, but it has some merit though. It's still in the Guinness Book of Records for being the game with the longest development time ever. 14 years and 44 days. But when the next print of the Book of Records comes out, Beyond Good and Evil 2 is going to take the throne as that, because that has gone on for even longer. It beat the record in October last year. So, but this was released, so is this vaporware? And I think it is, because this was not the ultimate first-person shooter they set out to build. This was a necessity to just put an end to a very sad story. Oh, man! It's only 229 days till Christmas. So have you started thinking about your Christmas shopping yet? If you haven't, I can recommend uh, the Neiman Marcus chain of department stores found in the southern states in the US. Every year they release the Neiman Marcus Christmas book. This is the 1969 edition of the book. And there are some really good ideas for gifts in there. The topic of the year 1969 were gifts that keep on growing. And you could buy a very slow growing gift like a baby elephant, or something fast growing like a plant. And this was in line with the things that Neiman Marcus had in their other catalogs. Uh, they once had a hiss and her set of camels. They had a colonial style chicken coop. You could get a mermaid swimsuit, swimming lessons included or a rose gold private jet. So something for everyone, the Nemo Marcus Christmas book. My personal favorite though is this one from the 1969 edition, the Honeywell Kitchen Computer. With the tagline, if she can only cook as well as Honeywell can compute. Gender equality was not what it's today in 1969. <coughs> So, but you can get this one, uh, the Honeywell Kitchen Computer. It would set you back uh, 10,600 US dollars. That would probably buy you a nice suburban home in uh, the Texas area at the time. But included in the, that price was a two week programming course because this obviously didn't come with any pre installed software. So, if you ever found yourself sort of reinventing the relational database when you were writing some recipe management software for fun, you were not the first one. Housewives in Texas have been there before you. So, um, but it's a beauty. It's the Honeywell Kitchen Computer. And uh, this is also the Honeywell Kitchen Computer, as uh, featured in the film The Billion Dollar Brain from 1967, so two years before. So, The Billion Dollar Brain is about a British spy who stumbles on a plot to overturn um, communism. And he solves this with the help of a supercomputer. It's starring Michael Caine and the Honeywell H200 computer, which is this one. Which was rebranded as the uh, Honeywell Kitchen Computer. Now, the Honeywell Kitchen Computer looks a lot nicer than the one in the film. But it's operated correctly in the film here. So, currently he's turning on the tape machine and uh, he's um, putting in some index cards to program it, and this is how we, you would use that. Just think about having something like this in your kitchen, that would be beautiful. <laughs> so, you might not think of IBM as a particularly design-savvy company, but in 1981, Paul Rand designed this lovely logo for uh, IBM. This is known as the Rebus logo. Um, it's 
Supporting the IBM Think Motto, and this is actually part of the permanent collection at the MoMA Museum in uh, New York. And um, this is the IBM Yellowbird computer from uh, 1976. It was designed by Tom Hardy. It's Tom Hardy's daughter demonstrating how to use the computer up there. It's an actually an interesting computer. It has a small printer over on the left-hand side. Uh, nice yellow color, inspired by Tweeterbird, of course. That's where the name comes from. And it had a cartridge slot uh, where you would insert software. And you would hook it up to your telly. So Tom Hardy took this computer to the IBM board and said, that could we make this thing? Uh, the IBM board were a bit skeptical about this one. Uh, IBM were not in the consumer electronics business. That was uh, the message. Uh, just to put things into context, 1976, that was the year when the Apple I computer, which was a motherboard that you had to assemble yourself and put in a wooden box, was released. So that was the state of home computing at the time. But Tom Hardy is not easily stopped. So the year after, he comes up with this thing. Uh, this is the IBM Aquarius computer. Um, compared to the Yellowbird computer, which was just a concept, not a functional computer, this was an actual working computer. And it had some nice concepts. It had something called program packs, which were software cartridges that you would pop into the machine, and they, those came with these cards that were context sensitive and had a touch interface on the right hand side. So sort of like the, like the right click menu of uh, 1977. But he also worked with the engineering teams at IBM and built this thing. And this had something called bubble memory in there, which was a solid state permanent storage memory that did not use any tape devices, hard drives or anything like that, much like the flash memory we have today. So this was an incredibly innovative computer. He also did it in the maroon red color that was the most popular color on IBM typewriters. Just to get the message across that, yes, we at IBM are doing consumer electronics. You will find typewriter in this color just in every third home in the States or something like that. Again, the IBM board were not impressed and they didn't put this into production. Uh, same year as the Commodore PET was released. Just think about it. This was a beautiful computer. I would love to have something like that. But even with all of those bumps along the way, uh, IBM's designers kept on going. And in 1992, uh, the same month as Kate Moss appeared on the cover of the Face magazine for the first time ever, the other uh, fashion magazine, ID, had an IBM computer on the front page with the headline, Can Design Save IBM? And this is the IBM LeapFrog computer, which is a tablet computer that they built and designed and built and tried to get made. It didn't really happen because IBM doesn't make great computers that look good. Uh, but this one as well is part of the MoMA co collection. So think about all the computers we could have had. Instead, IBM went on to build WebSphere, and I guess that's why quite a few of you are here. <laughs> so uh, one thing, whenever uh, Spotify comes with that Discover Weekly playlist, uh, there's one song that comes up over and over again on uh, mine, and that's uh, Gillian Welch's Everything is Free Now. Ever anyone heard that? Great song. Go, go look it up. It's from 2001, and it's about her being expected to give her music away for free. Which leads us to the story of Q-Tracks. Did anyone here have one of those Microsoft Student things? There's always someone in the room. This is James Blunt. This is a video. really old man for this song. We need a drum kit soon, but we haven't got a wooden box. Uh -huh. But we'll try. This is a song from all the songs for us to get now. Woo! Yeah! So, filmed it from inside of James Blunt's grand piano at the release of the Q-Tracks software or platform, music platform at the Medium Music Industry Festival in Cannes in uh, 2008. So uh, the Q-Tracks software was this. It was a uh, website 
actually built with Microsoft Silverlight, which was what came out of that Windows Long On UI story from earlier, and it looked like this. It was a uh, music site where you could go search for music, download music, and uh, put it onto your MP3 player, which is fairly, fairly decent. Um, the market leader at the time was uh, Apple's iTunes, so having a competitor for that would be good. Uh, strange thing, though. When you went on this, you can find albums like these. Uh, do any of you have these in your collections at home? Something like uh, Bruce Springsteen, Ultra Rare Tracks, uh, or The Beatles, Ultra Rare Tracks. Probably not, because these are bootleg albums that are only shared between hardcore collectors and burnt on CDs. And the thing was that uh, Q-Tracks was built on top of the LimeWire file sharing peer-to-peer <laughs> -peer platform. And there's one thing that you need to have in place if you are building a music distribution service, and that is licensing agreements with the rights holders to the music you have. Um, they didn't have this. Uh, they had the technology. Uh, a few months later that year, a small Swedish company released with something. They have the same brand profile color as this, and uh, that was the end of it. So, but even before that, uh, music was distributed on these things, these are compact discs, and this is a uh, CD manufacturing plant. And this thing looks expensive. So what if we could store data on uh, something more readily available? Something like, for instance, paper. Not to mention that people have been using paper to store information for ages. Uh, but there was a Indian Science Journal, International Journal of Technology and Engineering Studies, that announced a remarkable technology known as rainbow technology. This was a technology that would use regular paper to store data. And this is the, uh, the scientific article. Um, I'm not entirely sure if this holds up to scientific article standards, but it has the architecture diagram in there. Uh, it's working. It, this is the way it goes. But I think the interesting thing is uh, the statements they make about this, is that once rainbow technology is in, soon we will be watching full-length films from a piece of paper. That would be pretty amazing. And I also envision that we could have so, sort of like storage facilities where we have these cabinets where we put paper in folders and store loads of data. Storage centers, that would be, that would be brilliant. So uh, this is the technology, a sheet of A4 paper that measures uh, 210 times 297 millimeters. Uh, for you Brits, that would be 2.4 times 3.3 uh, Wiffles. Wiffles is a British marine measurement unit that is actually used. You can go look it up on Wikipedia. I'm not making this up. Uh, on this uh, piece of paper, we would uh, store Quite a lot of data, 450 gigabytes of data to be precise. So let's just do the back of the envelope on this. So let's be really generous and say that we have a state-of-the-art, best there is, flatbed scanner, uh, 1,200 dots per inch, and uh, we're going to do some more measurement transformations here, turning this into American measurements to figure out that we can have 134 million individual dots on a piece of paper if you print it full bleed, edge to edge. That's a lot. And uh, if we also have a very good printer um, that can have 250 different colors, that would give us one byte per dot or uh, 144 megabytes per page. That's, that's pretty good, I would say. Uh, it's the theoretical maximum, though. But it, it would look something like this. Um, I don't know if any of you remember, but in the 1990s, there was something called magic dot drawings that were, uh, were quite popular. They looked a bit like this. And uh, for those of you who don't know, we, you would focus on this, just stare at the actual image, keep on staring at it, and something would pop out from the paper and just be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was what this was. So this here is Ted Nelson. Uh, Ted Nelson is one of the unsung heroes of uh, IT culture and IT history. Uh, we should talk more about 
Ted Nelson. One of the things he's known for is publishing this thing, Computer Lib. Uh, he published this in 1974. Uh, it's entirely self-published. He did everything himself. He wrote all of the text. This is what it actually looks like. Wrote this on his typewriter, drew all of the illustration, cut and paste this together and got this printed and uh, released. Uh, this is a book that is describing computer science in layman's terms and having all of the things from uh, computer culture at the time in 1974, even a bit of that naughtiness that made uh, Duke Nukem Forever so widely popular. But I think computer lib is one thing, but on the flip side of this, uh, there was another book, Dream Machines. And uh, Dream Machines was Ted Nelson's vision for the future. So, welcome to the story of the adventures of Tell Nelson and Project Sanity. In the 1960s, Ted Nelson gets the idea for a concept he calls hypertext. You might have heard of that. Ted Nelson was the one who invented it. And uh, throughout the 60s, he designs this alone uh, under the name Sanity, which he chooses in 1967. The name is taken from the poem The Kubla Khan, and Sanadu is the mythical castle in the distance. And what Ted Nelson envisioned was that you would have something called Sanadu stands, which would be places where you could go and use a computer and connect into a library of all the world's knowledge, tied together by this thing he had invented called hypertext. And he figured that this would be like mom and pop shops that you could go to with your friends, sit down, use one of the Sanadu terminals, and uh, not only consume information, but also produce things and get proper attribution for the things you made so that you could also be paid for what you did. You would be out driving along with your family and you would see one of the screens on the roadside saying that two million screen hours served and he would pull off. The kids would sit down, maybe play a game from one of these terminals. Parents would wait a while to get one of the big vertical CRT screens, look at their vacation photos and reminisce over times and have a good time in these sanity stands. And this is Ted Nelson himself with a prototype that he built in cardboard and uh, balsa wood and whatnot, of what he envisioned one of these things to look like. This is um, the radically empathetic students interested in science, technology, and other research studies, or the Resistance for short, which was a computer club at uh, Princeton University. The average age of these people were 15 at the time, uh, the girl in front is Lauren Sarno. She was 14. She would become uh, Ted Nelson's personal assistant. They would go on to marry 46 years later, so she is now his wife. And these were the people helping Ted Nelson build his hypertext platform, Sanadu, throughout the 1970s. In the 1980s, he had people working for him building this. Uh, these were their actual titles. Uh, Roger Gregory was the system an anarchist. Mark Miller was the hacker. Uh, Phil Salin was an accelerator. And there was also Gail Pergamit, who was the hidden variable. Why, and that's why she's not in my drawing. Uh, at this time, they, John Walker, who was the creator of Autodesk, had uh, made a fortune on his uh, CAD software. And he was blown away by the Sanadu concept and the vision. And he said that in the 1960s, Sanadu was a dream in a single mind. In 1980, it was the shared goal of a small group of brilliant technologists. By 1989, it will be a product. And by 1995, it will begin to change the world. So he invested in that. From 1995, these two people have changed the world. This is Mark Andresen and Tim Berners-Lee, creator of the first ever web browser and HTML, hypertext. And this did indeed change the world. 
What does it mean to you uh, if you could uh, tell us uh, how would the future look like? Where yeah. would computers and the well, well, so, okay. What, what we're trying to do with Project Xanadu is create a world so startling that most people, we have something called Xanadu shock, okay? And every one of us has gone through three or four levels of Xanadu shock, and we don't know how many levels there are of Xanadu shock as you realize what you're creating. And we, we you know, we continually go through it ourselves. Basically, we, we've discovered what, is, what has to be the right and fundamental design for the world of life in the future. A system which is, has both a rational form of storage that is not elsewhere available in computer them, and a way of linking them all together so that anything published on any one computer anywhere in the world or in space can be accessed instantly. Less speed of light considerations, less disk queuing, less a few things like that. Uh, so that essentially, within seconds, you will have access to anything that is written and published. It's very different from people in the video disc world, for example. If you're in the video disc world, somebody's got to have the video disc right there in the room. What good is that? I don't want a subset. No subset will do. And that's the whole point. If you can't have it all, look somewhere else. And, and, and the point of Xanadu is that as we get this ever-expanding library with millions of people online simultaneously, they will all be able to publish simultaneously, add things, annotate, make links, and we hope live in a freer environment than we live in now. Now there's some big political issues here. And that's also going to be in my next book, Copy Told Me Now. Thanks very much. This is Ted Nelson, 1980, telling people about the vision of Sanadu. And uh, he's still building the product. He's 86 years old now and is still going, believing in Project Sanadu that this will be the ultimate web ever. This is something entirely different. This is Nerd Perfect Nerd Processing Vaporware, a uh, product released um, in uh, 1987 by Vaporsoft Incorporated. And uh, it was a booklet. Uh, it also came with a floppy disk. Uh, those of you who have seen one of these might see that there's something missing. The actual disk inside is not there. Um, and uh, as I said, there's a booklet with loads of stories in there and uh, so forth. Uh, so this was released uh, and uh, got very favorable uh, press coverage. Uh, I think one of these is uh, particularly interesting. Uh, there were so many pinstripes at uh, one show, it looked like it's herd of zebras, or a bunch of bankers, as you would say here in Britain. Um, Vaporsoft Corporation was handing out demo disks of Nerd Perfect. It's nerd processing vaporware, had slick promotions all over Comdex. This delicious product has no specs, no price, no delivery date, but will solve every micromanager's problem anyway. It eventually came on the market. You can still find this on eBay. Uh, you have, will have to pay, pay quite a hefty price for it. But it was the first product to deliver exactly what it said on the box, absolutely nothing. And I think this article from uh, a local newspaper uh, in Portland, which was where Vaporsoft was from, says this perfectly, the high-tech pet rock of 1987. The pet rock was something that was sold in the 1960s on mail order in the United States. It was an actual stone, and the person who sold this made millions on it. But I think we can, we can have a laugh and uh, laugh at all these stories and uh, these people who have built or set out to build strange software. But I also think we should be very respectful of these people because these are the kind of people who push things forward, who make true changes in the world. Because if people don't dare to have those visions and dare to make a bet on their own ideas, nothing would ever happen. And uh, some of these people have invested all their money and some of them have invested all their time, and some of them have invested their entire life in this. It's been very lonely, but I've been absolutely sure of what I've been doing all the time. So one of the main definitions of paranoia is believing what nobody else believes. So one cure is for the patient to change his mind and believe what the rest of the world believes. That is the low road. 
The other, by which I hope to cure myself, is to persuade everybody else. And then I will no longer be paranoid, but recognized as having been right all along. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. This has been Vaporware, the best software that ever was. I'm Anders Noros. Have a great unconference and a great rest of DevOps for the two upcoming days. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>